Our Heavenly Father, our God, our King, our Savior, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we will speak to us again this morning through your servant, and we pray, Lord, and we commit him to you that you will give him strength and empower him, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, that he will have boldness, Lord, and conviction and clarity and our simplicity of sharing your word to us. And as we receive, Lord, your word, Father, our prayer also is that you will give us understanding in our hearts, Father, and help us to understand and apply the truth that we're going to hear this morning. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sir J.R. Last August uh, 21, I've shared with you the first part of this sermon. And we've learned that the baptism of the Holy Spirit promised in Acts chapter 1 verse 5 will come at Pentecost. And the birth of the church is tied up with, with it. Now, where is the evidences that uh, indeed the Holy Spirit uh, came? <coughs> Always remember that uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit happened uh, during Pentecost and the birth of the church is tied up with it. Now in verses 1 to 4, remember that the church was designed to be born at Pentecost to fulfill the Old Testament predictions or prophecies. The Holy Spirit came as the first uh, fruits guarantee of our full inheritance. In fact, in Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, it says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Remember, like salvation, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is non-experiential. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not something you experience, but it is a reality. Dili kini kasinatian ko dili kamatuuran. The little tongues sort of moving like a flames rested on each one of them to show that the baptism of the Holy Spirit had occurred. This is the evidence. The little tongue sort of moving like flames rested on each one of them. The baptism of the Holy Spirit also is permanent. Ang pagbautismo niya sa balang Espiritu, permanente kini. You will never lose the Holy Spirit because of what Ephesians 1, 13-14 says that He is the guarantee of our future inheritance. And that's permanent. What's the result of the Holy Spirit's coming? The results are found in verses 5 to 11. The results of the Holy Spirit's coming. Now remember, the Spirit comes in verses 1 to 4. And the 12 apostles and the 120 believers are filled with the Holy Spirit, we see the immediate effect in verses 5 to 11. According to verse uh, 5, Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. In Acts uh, 2, beginning on verse 5, it says, Dito sa Jerusalem, ni atong higayuna, may mga hudiyong nga religiyos kaayo, Nagikan sa nagkalain lain nasun sa kalibutan. Now the word God fearing in the New King James Version is devout. It means cautious. The fact that they are there during the Pentecost made them cautious of not offending God. Last August 19, uh, 2016, the Philippine Star has uh, said that the immigration authorities in Manila intercepted 177 Indonesians carrying Philippine passports before they boarded a flight to Saudi Arabia. 
to participate in a Hajj pilgrimage. This is what happening in uh, in Acts uh, 2 verse 5. God fearing Jews not attending the Hajj pilgrimage, pilgrimage, but the Pentecost. According to the news, each Indonesian paid six thousand U.S. dollars. If you uh, convert that into peso, multiplied by 177, that's a big amount. 47 plus million pesos. That's how uh, corrupt some of our government officials are. They came back. These God-fearing Jews came from all over the known world at that time. There were pilgrims who have been part of the dispersion of the Jews in previous centuries, like the Assyrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity. They were dispersed, they were brought captive to those places, and they came back to Jerusalem for the Pentecost, according to verse 6 of your Bible. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Sa pagkadubog sa mga tao sa kabanha, sa lain na si Mahana translation, o sa hinugdan kining lano, midubog ang panon sa katawan. Nadubog sila o natingala sila pag-ayo kay ang tagsa-tagsa kapag tutuo, nagsutiman sa tagsa-tagsa kapinulungan sa mga namati. Now the term sound is singular. Obviously, it does not refer to the language, but to the sound from the blast of a violent wind in verse 2. Remember? They were attracted to the sound. Na-attract sila sa lano. They came together in bewilderment around the house where the sound was originating. Why bewildered? Na nung natingala man sila, it is because each one in the house speak in their own language. Now take note, everybody heard his own language. Therefore, it's not an ecstatic speech, but a real language. Verse 7, utterly amazed, they ask, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Busa sa dakong kahibulong o katingalan ninyo sila, hindi ba tagang Galilea man kinig mga tauhana? Now, Galileans were the people living in somewhat uncivilized place. They were uneducated. Hindi sila edukado. Everybody knows that Galileans are inferior. It is an insult if you are called Galileans. These people are not linguists. And the pilgrims attending the Pentecost were amazed that they are all speaking these languages. Now remember, I told you last time, that the language is a sign of judgment. Ang pinulungan, maukili ang sinyali sa paghukong. Isaiah is giving a series of warning found in Isaiah chapter 28 to the northern kingdom or Israel represented by Ephraim verses 1 to 13 and to the southern kingdom represented by Judah in verses 14 to 29 of Isaiah 28. In fact, in Isaiah 28 verse 11, it says, Very well then, with foreign lips and strange tongues, God will speak to these people. Kung hindi ka mong mamati ka na po, makiksundi ang ginoo ka ninyo, pinaki sa mga langyaw, na dili masabot ang sinotihan. Foreign lips will deliver the message of judgment on them. Now Isaiah was referring to the Assyrians who invaded Israel in 722 BC. The message to Israel of destruction by foreign invaders was also for Judah, representing southern kingdom. A few years later, the Babylonians invaded Judah. Now when Paul is explaining the meaning of the gift of language in 1 Corinthians 14, he quoted Isaiah 28. What did it mean on the day of Pentecost when all of a sudden these believers took the place of a prophet and started to speak in Gentile language? Remember? What is the point of this sign? Of speaking in different languages? It is judgment on Israel. Now, I want you to listen carefully that at this point, 
Israel is set aside and the church is born to take her place to bring the message of salvation to all the people. God is going to make his people from every tribe and nation to form the church. Israel will uh, save a remnant of the nation Israel but not an exclusive ethnic people of God. Yun ang kapoy maluwas sa mga taga Israel, apan dili sila separate. Instead, they will be joined together to form the church. And the physical judgment of the nation Israel happened in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed and killed them. And the crowds who gathered around the upper room where the believers, where the believers were staying are Jewish people or new convert to Judaism. They were amazed because God is being praised in Gentile language, not in the usual Hebrew. Pretty good nilang hibulungan kaya ang ilan ayong nahibaluhan that God will be praised, will be given praise and worship using the Hebrew language, not the Gentile language. Now in verses 8, 9, and 10 of your Bible, then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? And in verses 9, 10, and 11, Peter enumerated those uh, languages, those places. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Now in order for us to appreciate those uh, places and languages being mentioned, this is the nations of uh, Pentecost found in Acts 2, 9 to 11. You can Google this on the net and uh, you can find this uh, a map. So we are here, Jerusalem, during the Pentecost. Starting from the east down to the west, Peter enumerated uh, the places where the pilgrims who are attending Pentecost came from. That's an overview, but if you want to have more uh, a graphical map, you can use this one. Pero vintage ang moragaraan. Kugalan ka modern, modi ang modern na map. Mura siya ang Google map. Pero balay ko dito sa akin na mas klaro-klaro siya. The places were labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, down to last place. The enumeration of these nations begin, begin at the east here and uh, proceeds to the west down here. This is north, this is uh, south, this is east, this is west. Parthians mean those Jews or proselytes who dealt in uh, Parthia, or here, Parthians. The language spoken there was that of Persia, and ancient writers, Parthia and Persia, often mean the same country. The second uh, nation enumerated there is Medes, was situated westward and southward of the Caspian Sea. Uh, where is that? Down there. Okay. The Medes are often mentioned frequently in connection with the Persians, with whom they were often connected under the same government. If I'm not mistaken, the origin of the uh, wise men who visited the Lord Jesus Christ uh, at his birth came from this place. Elamites is often mentioned in the Old Testament. The nation was descended from Elam, the son of Shem. They are mentioned as part of the Persian Empire. Daniel is said to have resided at Shushan, which is in the province of Elam. By the way, uh, there are uh, six known empires throughout the history, and one is coming. First, the Egyptian Empire, followed by the Assyrian, followed by the Babylonian, uh, Persian, uh, Alexander the Great, the uh, Greece, and then Romans, six. Okay. The language of these people was, of course, Persian. Mesopotamia is the region lying between the rivers Euphrates and Tigris. In this 
region was situated some important places mentioned in the Bible like Ur of the Chaldees, the birthplace of Abraham. Next is Judea. Judea has been thought that difficult. Um, Naibulong sila nga nung giapil ang Judea. Had been thought difficult to see why it should be mentioned. And the favorable interpretation was that they spoke so many languages other than, main, other than their main language. Next is Cappadocia, was a region of Asia Minor. Over there. Okay. The language which was spoken here is not certainly known. It was probably mi a mixed dialect made up of Greek and Syrah, perhaps the same as that of their neighbors, the Lycaonians. Next is Pontos, was another province of Asia Minor and was situated north of Cappadocia and west of Paphlagonia. Next, the word Asia is used here to denote the regions or provinces west of these, which are not particularly enumerated. It probably embraced uh, Mysia, Elis, Ionia, Caria, and Lydia. The capital of this region was Ephesus. Remember Ephesus? Next is, uh, uh, by the way, this place, this region was frequently called Ionia, and was afterward the seat of the seven churches in Asia. Remember Revelation chapter 1 verse 4? Next is Phrygia and Pamphylia were also two provinces of Asia Minor. Phrygia was surrounded by Galatia. Remember the, Gal uh, the letter to the Galatians? Cappadocia and Pisidia. Pamphylia was on the Mediterranean and was bounded north by Pisidia. The language of these places was the Greek, more or less pure Greek. Then is Egypt was well known on the south of the Mediterranean, watered by the Nile. There's Egypt here. The language used there was the Coptic uh, uh, tongue. At present, the Arabic is spoken. Vast numbers of Jews dwelt in Egypt, and many from that country would be present at the great feast of, at Jerusalem. In this country, Egypt, the first translation of the Old Testament was made, which is now called the Septuagint. Next is Libya. Libya is a general name for Africa. It probably denoted the region which was near to Egypt. The Greeks gave the name to all Africa. Cyrene, in it, in it, in it, in it, in this place. Cyrene was a region about 500 miles west of Alexandria. Remember Simon? Simon who was compelled to bear our Savior's cross to the place of crucifixion came from this place, according to Matthew 27, 32. And some of the Cyrenians are mentioned among the earliest Christians in Acts chapter 11. Number 13, visitors from Rome here, very far. Visitors from Rome were Jews who had taken up their residence in Italy. They had come to Jerusalem to attend the great feast. The language which they spoke was Latin. Number 14, Crete. Crete is an island in the Mediterranean about 200 miles in length and 50 in uh, uh, breadth, I am not so sure, about 500 miles southwest of Constantinople. Now, it was the residence of Titus, remember Titus, who was left there by Paul to set in order the things that were missing. And the Cretans among the Greeks were famous for deceit and falsehood. And last is Arabia. Arabia is the great uh, peninsula which is bounded north by part of Syria, east by the uh, Euphrates and the Persian Gulf, south by the Indian Ocean. 
it is often mentioned in, in the scripture. The language spoken there was the Arabic. So 15 places, different languages. And these uh, pilgrims heard the people in the upper room, the 12 apostles and the 120 believers speaking in their own native tongues. A very sad story, I'm sure you have heard this one. Very sad story because a guy visit his dying Chinese girlfriend at the hospital. The Chinese girl said, Buyao, Sai, Yanki, Wan, Bushu. Then she died. May the dungan sa yahang boyfriend. The guy, the boyfriend went all the way to China to find the meaning of his girlfriend's last word. And he was shocked to know the real meaning. Sa sibuhan doon ay ang buyaw sa buyang jiguan busyo ayaw tamaki ang wires out si Jin. O namatay noon kaya yung tamakan ang wires out si Jin. Listen to the line of pinulungan. So what's the importance in enumerating the crowd's place of origin? Nga nung ki lista man, kisuti man ni Peter ang mga places di nagagikan ang pilgrims. It is because with these foreign languages, they declare the wonders of God. Pinaagyan ng mga pinulungan ilang gideklarar ang mga kahibulungan ng gibuhat sa Dios. These are about everything in the Old Testament that talks about God's mighty works in Gentile language. When they declare the wonders of God, Luke calls this the fullness of the Holy Spirit. In verse 4. By the way, the gamit of Peter kaganihan ni si Luke ay pagbote pasabot. Si Luke ang ang pagbote pasabot. Now Luke calls this the fullness of the Holy Spirit in verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit Spirit gave them utterance. Being filled with the Holy Spirit here is being overwhelmed with the greatness of God. Kung ang sa katao mapunos sa balang Espiritu, iyang makita ang pagkagamahanan, ang pagkahibulungan sa ato ang Diyos. The Spirit was giving them the word, the utterance. Now since the word was of God's greatness, being filled with the Holy Spirit means that the Spirit's experience of the greatness of God becomes our experience of the greatness of God. That's why every Sunday we can sing song of praise every Sunday, every day of our lives, uh, glorifying, worshiping the greatness of our God. And the crowd asks, what does this mean? Namutala ang mga pilgrims, kung sa makinig, Pangitabuwa, amazed and uh, verse 12, this is the response of the Holy Spirit's coming. This is the answer to the question, what does this mean? First, there is confusion in verses 12 and 13. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Kung sa ilang katingala o kalibog nagpangutan anay sila, kung sa may kahulugan ni ini. When the Holy Spirit came, the apostles and the 120 believers in the upper room were able to speak foreign languages they did not know. This is the miracle of Pentecost. The crowds were confused, and in verse 13 it says, Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have too much wine. Apan ang uban nagbugal-bugal na nag-ingon ang mga hubog, mga hubog kini mga tawhana. They were confused because it's impossible for them to get drunk because it is only 9 in the morning, according to verse 15. Alas nabi pa sa buntag, they serve fre fresh juice in the morning, thus it's not even fermented, wala pa na bakal, kung sa tuba pa. 
The crowds were confused, but not Peter with the 11 and the 120 believers. Because to them, there is conviction. Verses 14 to uh, 21. Verse 14 in your Bible, it says, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Nya mitinog si Pedro uban sa unsi ka mga apostoles o sa makusog na tinog pinon ka nila. Mga kahit suhunan kung hodiyo. Kung kamong tanan nga niya sa Jerusalem, pamatian ninyo ang akong isulti karun. Ingo na verse 15. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only 9 in the morning. Kini mga tawahan na dilihubog, sumala sa inyong gihuna-una, kay alas noy may puman lang karun sa puntag. Now Peter offers a true explanation of the question. The Apostle Peter, what does this mean? These men are not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. But this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. Now it is interesting to note that the apostle clearly understood the Old Testament. You